Welcome to the Denver United Sermon of the Week. Here's a message from Pastor Rob Brendel. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to worship with us this morning. If you are still waking up, you are good and at home. I'll tell you what, the, um, the spring forward sword cuts both ways every year, doesn't it? But for me, it's mostly redeeming because it's like international instant gratification day. For people that want it now and learn that mostly in life you don't get it when you want it, this is the day that's the exception that proves the rule, right? I was out walking my dog yesterday afternoon at twilight thinking, man, I miss the days when it's light and sunny out kind of after work. Voila, it's going to be light and sunny out today after work for me. So I feel gratified. So excited about Alpha, as Lucy mentioned, kicked off this week. If you missed the first week, but you've been wanting to come or you've invited somebody and uh, for one reason or another, it didn't work, uh, it's still sort of an open enrollment window. You can jump in this week and it'll be great. It's 6.30 on Tuesday night, begins with dinner, conversation. It was really a special time and I'm so excited for what the Lord's doing there. Please keep praying with us um, that uh, what Jesus said would be true. You know, he, he said, when you lift me up, I'll draw people to myself. And what that does is puts responsibility, but also takes off pressure from us, right? We don't have to force install Jesus, nor do we have to sort of overly couch or apologize for the gospel. We simply model the love of Jesus in an authentic way, uh, create spaces of honor, dignity, and safety for one another to be where we find ourselves and engage uh, with his truth. And Jesus does what he does, which is to draw people to himself um, without any pressure uh, and with lots of love. So that's what Alpha's about. Look forward uh, to being with, uh, with a bunch of you then. All right, ready to jump into the word this morning? Father, as we, um, as we seek you, would you help us to find you? Lord, when we seek you with all of our hearts, we give our attention to your word now. This is our worship, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I shared with you at the end of last year that the summer of 2021 was particularly difficult as uh, we lost my father. And I realized on reflection over the last few months that while we lost him in, in point of practical and physical fact in August, I had lost my dad gradually over the course of the preceding seven years. He declined steadily with dementia and Parkinson's disease. And so uh, the father that I knew and that loved me so much and I learned so much from, uh, I ceased to, to be able to, um, to relate to, to have uh, many years before the time that he passed. This is tender for me still. I'm working through my year of firsts as those who grieve understand. Um, But something that I've learned in my journey uh, with my dad is how simply uh, to be, how to be with him. It became apparent after the first couple of years that there was no fixing this. Barring a, a miracle, dementia is irreversible and it's progressive, right? So the hardest parts were when we would hear from someone who walked this road with their own loved one, and they would be compassionate, empathetic, but hesitant to talk about the end. And I, of course, now understand why. We would read journals and blogs, and for a while, my fix-it family, doers all, would try to understand more and then research different treatment options and see different doctors and Perhaps that was merely a way to stave off the inevitable, the grief, the loss, some place to hang our, our minds and hearts while learning to walk that road, that road of sharp stones and pitfalls with tender feet. My dad's slow decline over many years were humbling for him. He was a man of prodigious intellect. When I was born, he was a professor at the United States Military Academy teaching the next generation of army officers. 
courageous and intelligent and selfless. He was a lifelong teacher, whether it was advanced economics or third grade Sunday school. He loved to impart truth in a way that is so rare for intellectuals uh, that was humble, that would come down to your level and believe in your capacity to learn. He was a great teacher. And to see his mind go was particularly difficult for me. The way that I mostly interacted with my dad was on the level of ideas. He grew little by little in his own understanding of his emotions and became more tender as I grew older. But it was in the realm of thoughts and ideas, of happenings around the globe, of geopolitics and possibilities for the future that I connected with him. And so as his complex reasoning and memory recall began to fail, my connection with him began to diminish as well until the point nearer the time of his going home to be with Jesus where I scarcely remembered what our relationship was like at all and how that grieved me. I think on reflection, those years of relationship, they were about caring for a man who cared for me, but they were about our mutual heavenly fathers caring for me even more. My learning to receive his care, my learning to understand how to do this work of shepherding a congregation through all of the trials and pains of life like the one I experienced. And about learning what to do when, when there is no fix. And that's our subject this morning. We're in Matthew 25, of course. We've read this passage for several weeks. It was Jesus' last and most literal parable. And he spoke to his disciples just before he went to the cross. He said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left and the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world for I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink, I was a stranger and you invited me into your home, I was naked and you gave me clothing. We've looked at each of these sayings of Jesus in succession over the last several weeks, aiming to understand what he's asking of us. He continues, I was sick and you cared for me, I was in prison and you visited me. And then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Truly, I tell you, Jesus often said, our series is asking, what if he meant it? What if this isn't a metaphor or classic Jesus hyperbole? What if compassion for the last, the lowest, the least of these, what if that is love for Jesus? This morning we're zooming in on the second half of verse 36. I was sick, he said, and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. It's interesting what he didn't say as much as what he did. He didn't say over against uh, a life and ministry career of healing and release from spiritual bondage. He didn't say, <clears throat> you healed me. I was sick and you came and made me better. I was in prison and, and you released me said, you were just there for me. And I think this is the thing that he's getting at in this verse. Jesus is mostly not asking if we'll solve problems, 
but if we'll sit with people, if we'll do that humble, slow, and often thankless work of love, will we sit with people? I think we get it done, have side of the tracks Westerners tend to approach care with a sort of spiritual or religious triage mentality. We're going to identify the greatest needs with the most opportunity to solve the problem. And we're going to either fix it or move on to where we can be more helpful. One of my pastor mentors who's in heaven now, Eugene Peterson, puts this elegantly in his book for pastors called The Contemplative Pastor. This applies to all of us in our work of care and compassion. Life in God, he writes, is not so much a problem to be solved as a mystery to be explored. There is certainly the biblical stance in this. Life is not something we manage to hammer out together and keep in repair by our wits. It is an unfathomable gift. We are immersed in mysteries, incredible love, confounding evil, the creation, the cross, grace, and God. To the point, the secularized mind is terrorized by these mysteries. Thus, it makes lists, labels people, assigns roles, and solves problems. But listen, a solved life is a reduced life. We live in a cult of experts who explain and solve. The vast technological apparatus around us gives us the impression that there is a tool for everything if only we can afford it. He goes on to say when we understand ourselves this way as spiritual technologists, we're hard put to keep that role from absorbing everything else since there are so many things that need to be and can, in fact, be fixed. But what are we to do when there is no fix? We live out the gospel more, Jesus teaches and models. We live out the gospel more completely, more authentically in enduring compassion than we do in crisis resolution, when we walk the long road with others. And so the question Jesus asks is a disquieting one. Do we have time for people whose problem is unlikely to resolve? Do we have time for them if we don't have a solution for them? In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul writes, let love be genuine. And this, I believe, is the topic sentence for the paragraph. He's talking about genuine, authentic love versus a form of love or a snap to culture's grid. Let love be genuine. So abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. What a powerful refrain. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Listen, verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of saints and seek to show hospitality. You see in Paul's teaching an explication on Jesus' last parable. Contribute to the needs of the saints. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Show hospitality. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Well, he goes on to say, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I was sick and you visited me, you sat with me, even when you couldn't do anything about it, perhaps no one could. I was in prison, forgotten, left behind by society, and you came and visited with me. 
What if weeping with someone who's weeping because they're sick or because they're lonely and hopeless and locked away, what if that's all we're able to do? Jesus' question is, is that enough for us? Can that be enough for us simply to weep with those who weep? Because friends, this is empathy. And it is at once the most powerless feeling and the most powerful force in another's life. Compassion for the lowest one, we've said, is love for Jesus. Empathy, I would suggest, is the heart of compassion. Noted social worker and research professor, and now morning talk show host celebrity, it seems, Brene Brown, in her wonderful book called Daring Greatly, observed empathy is a strange and powerful thing. There is no script. There is no way, right or wrong, to do it. It's simply listening, holding space without or withholding judgment, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly healing message of you're not alone. Empathy. Now, when I read this and I, I get to the middle part, I confess I trip over the, the pop phrase, holding space. It makes me want to snigger and laugh and buy male yoga pants and eat an overpriced paleo bar and pretend that it was good. <laughs> but the, the catchphrase aside, listen to the heart of this explanation. Genuine love as the Apostle Paul's talking about, endures in caring, without judgment. It sits with, it attempts to feel with, and endure with another. Genuine love does that, it endures in caring. Beyond the flourish of a compassionate phrase or gesture, it says in verse 12 here, be patient in tribulation. And the context here is not our own tribulation, it's others. It's talking about love that's genuine. It's talking about loving one another, outdoing one another in showing honor, contribute to the, contributing to the needs of one another. So in that immediate context, being patient in tribulation might have less to do with patience for ourselves and what we wish for and more to do with patience with another and what they wish for. Never thought of it that way. I have to say. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, take tender care of those who are weak and be patient with everyone. This patience is in the context of other people's weakness and our tender care. It says, take tender care that is more than uh, a post or showing up with a meal, which is wonderful, but it's enduring. It's long-suffering with another. This concept of long suffering is two parts foreign. It's foreign to endure ourselves for a long time in the same direction. It's doubly foreign, I would suggest, for many of us as modern Westerners to suffer long with another. But I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. Fascinating, isn't it? That he who came to set captives free to heal the sick, he who proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God with such extraordinary, <clears throat> excuse me, miracles. Fascinating that he said, I was sick and you came to visit me. I was in prison and you walked that road of companionship. Colossians 3, Paul writes, put on as God's holy and chosen ones, compassionate hearts. And so he seems to describe what a compassionate heart looks like, kind, humble, meek, and patient, bearing with one another in love. How good are we at bearing with one another? I confess that I find that that's one of those tragically weak muscles. I want quick change. I want efficacious 
treatment. I want to find what's going to reverse my dad's cognitive decline. And if I can't reverse it, slow it down, alleviate the symptoms. I want to fix the problem. And I believe that's part of what's righteous in me. That's Jesus working itself out. It's just not the only righteous thing. Bearing with one another in weakness, in sickness, in irrelevance. We live in a generation that's in constant pursuit of a life hack, of a shortcut. A quick fix, an easy solution so that we don't have to do this thing of bearing with, of suffering long. Our culture promises and I would add delivers all sorts of fast acting results. And it leaves us altogether unconditioned simply to sit with others in affliction. Over the ensuing years of my father's decline, I came to learn it was clunky and irregular, but I came to learn how to sit with him. And so once every couple of months for a few years, I would fly to Atlanta and often get back late on Saturday night in order to be here on Sunday morning. I would go for a day or two and I learned fitfully, fidgety and uncomfortable simply to sit with him. And I learned to sit with my mom, to listen with my ears, but also with my heart, to walk the long road that seemed to be going nowhere Anathema to my soul, though it was. I discovered that there was a sort of um, 50 first dates phenomenon with my dad. Do you remember that movie with Drew Barrymore where um, she had a traumatic brain injury and so Adam Sandler was trying to to win her heart, but he had to redo it every day. (laughs) And so he started to experiment by trial and error with what would work and what wouldn't work. And a couple of times he tried a tactic that crashed and burned badly. So he scratched that one. And then he started to find conversation topics that consistently warmed her heart. He found avenues into what wasn't damaged in her soul and connected there. It was a beautiful picture of love for as coarse as as the humor was. And I I discovered that with my dad. It was sort of my mom and my sister and I would joke about it. I, I found a few conversation topics I would start that he would want to engage, but wouldn't be able to keep up intellectually. And he would get so discouraged and frustrated because he would try to hold out the appearance that he could stay with the conversation and then he would have to say, I I just don't remember. So I would scrap that. You know, my dad used to be like, um, he was a dead ringer for for like casual conversation about the Peloponnesian War or like the third conflict in the War of the Roses. You know, Henry V's uh, greatness and his son's lackluster succession. My dad was conversant on things that, that are unnatural. In, his, in a human mind. But those were mostly gone. And he couldn't retain the plots of his beloved 1,200-page geeky historical fiction novels. And so those went out the window. But I, would, I found that he kept... Did anyone walk through this with a, a, your, maybe your parent or spouse? He kept some of the deep files. Do you know what I mean, Peg? Like, he couldn't remember that I visited a couple months ago. But he remembered like what he did the summer after his plebe year at West Point, weirdly, in in, in great detail. And so I started asking him questions about those things, things that frankly I didn't know about him. And I got to know my dad at another level and and I found ways that that paths that that conversation would take, like a choose your own adventure, adventure book when you were 12 in the 80s. And I would follow the path that would lead to gladdening his heart. We would have the same conversation 10, 20, 100 times, but it, it brought joy to him. And in sitting with him and checking out of my fast-paced and productive life, I connected with my father 
in a way that I never probably would have and certainly wouldn't have imagined once I accepted the irreversibility of his condition. And I think in the process, I connected with something of my heavenly father and what Jesus designed my soul to do. Sorry, this is a little tender for me. It's the first time I've talked about this, um, you know, outside of my wife and a couple of friends. And so um, it's a little hard. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus, Scripture says, returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. This was after he was enunciated by the voice of God at the start of his ministry. This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended on him. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit after being baptized in water by John the Baptist and then immediately led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil and now his ministry, it seems, was to begin. He came back full of the Holy Spirit's power after that spiritual battle and victory in the desert and reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues, was praised by everyone and when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Friends, this is the message of the gospel. This is the gospel that Jesus preached and modeled and installed when he died on the cross and rose from the grave victorious. His gospel from the moment in Mark chapter 1 that he began to preach after this day until he rose from the dead was the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is God's consummation of his goodness with creation, God's restoration work. He said, Jesus, behold, I'm making all things new. It's healing the sick. It's freeing the captives. This is the gospel. Ironic then that Jesus enjoins us simply to sit by their side. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't wish that we pray for healing and that he doesn't work powerfully through the prayers of his saints. That's not the point at all. But that mostly his charge for us is enduring compassion. When we sit with suffering friends, we defy the quick fix, the easy explanation, the life hack culture in which we're immersed from birth and we proclaim the promise of God's restoration, of transcendent and comprehensive salvation. We demonstrate the gospel. Our sustained compassion bears witness to Jesus in this way. Our powerlessness to fix, but willingness to sit and suffer alongside. See, it points to our Savior's power. It says, I am not, but he is more than able. It says that I am weak, but when I am weak, I am strong. And so are you. It says that the report of this world is not the end, and this is not all the good that is to come. Our compassion models Jesus' heart. Mark 1, filled with compassion, he reached out and touched the man with leprosy. Mark 6, Jesus had compassion on the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 14, Jesus landed, saw a large crowd and had compassion on them and he healed their sick. And in Matthew 20, there are so many more. Jesus had compassion on the two blind men and he touched their eyes. Jesus led with compassion, not with power. His power rode into the world on the tracks of a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. When we skip that part and go to the quick fix, we not only don't model Jesus, we show the world a tawdry counterfeit of the gospel, a gospel that at the end of the day will leave them disappointed and wanting. Jesus said, when you lift me up, I will draw all men in. We're called to show people that Jesus sees 
and he, is care, and he cares, and he is more than able. He is making all things new. And so our charge here, I believe, in this passage, what perhaps Jesus is getting at in this last phrase is to engage others with empathy. And if you're like me, Those are muscles that are a little weak, kind of like how in the early 21st century, we all discovered we had a core and we all discovered that it was woefully weak and that's the source of all of our problems. Like if you have social anxiety, it's probably because your core is weak. (laughs) Have you noticed? Just a a strong core fixes everything. (laughs) Oh, it's good. I love my home workout where Sean T is like, use your core. And I I hear his voice as I'm like walking up the stairs. He's like, don't just walk up the stairs, master the stairs. So I come back from using the restroom in our office during the week and I'm like, I am using my core going up these stairs. (laughs) Have you noticed though that that we, we probably don't work as physically hard as our predecessor generations. And so there's those muscles that are chronically weak and lead to health problems. Like jokes aside, I think that empathy is like that. Shanti might as well have you going up the stairs like a boss going, use your empathy. Because listen, it's shriveled and atrophied in our culture. So Jesus' charge is to engage with empathy, to use our empathy core muscles. What does that look like? Listen all the way. It's just so simple except for how bad we are at doing it. Let me say me, I am at doing it. I, my mind half listens and half formulates solutions, right? I listen until I think I've got what the real problem is, whether or not the poor slept talking knows or not. And then I start formulating solutions and I wait for the person to breathe. Okay, here's what's really going on. It's what my soul wants to say. Listen all the way. We're listening not primarily to gain information and formulate courses of action, but to connect with another human soul like Jesus did. Listen all the way and then practice attunement. Practice attunement. A noted child psychologist said that attunement is allowing our internal state to shift, to come to resonate with the inner world of another. Practice attunement, allowing our inner state to shift a little bit. However right we think we are, however sized up we think we have their problem, however sure we feel that we know what they need, allow our internal state to shift. Isn't that a great statement? And then resonate with the inner world of another person. And then withhold judgment. Oh man, i reading through the Bible every year. I dread when I get to Job. It's like that movie that you've watched a bunch of times and you want the ending to be different. You want them not to do that thing they do every time at that point in the movie. I so badly want Job's friends this time through to be good because they're half good. They're there. They run to his side and they start out compassionate, but they don't stay there, do they? Why? Because they start judging, judging, judge, judge, judging everything. They got the right of it. And then they start talking and then they won't stop talking. And then they turn into these insufferable blowhards that you just want to like X out of the story. If we could simply withhold judgment, what if we know, what if for the sake of argument, we're right, we have the right of it and we simply don't say it. Do we have that capacity? It feels immoral in this apocryphal cultural morality of ours to know what's right and not say it. How often though was that Jesus's way? Think of it. Every person he ever spoke to before they parted their lips to speak, he knew exactly what was wrong and what they needed. Yet how little did he prescribe? What if we withheld judgment and simply sat with, lingered longer, and then tried to feel with another person? And for some of us who are thinkers first and doers second, feeling with is is a bridge too far, or so we would think. And it's, it's easy to dismiss out of hand as, oh, that's all that touchy-feely stuff, Pastor. Let's get back to rolling up our sleeves and serving the poor. Well, that's good and all, except that's not the only thing Jesus said. 
And so if you want half of Jesus, stop there. But Jesus also challenges us to recognize the full spectrum of the imago dei, God's image in us. We're made in his image, not just in so far as we have two eyes and ears or that we have hands with opposable thumbs where we can lift and do and help and give food to those who need it, but also in our hearts, in our capacity for compassion, for long suffering, for bearing with, in our potential to feel with another. When others feel felt, it communicates something powerful. It communicates you're not alone. And that is a powerful reality. That is very close to the center of the gospel. You're not alone. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not a hopeless case. You're not an irretrievable cause. You are a daughter, a son of the most high God. You are seen, known, valued. There is everlasting hope. God is more than able in our compassion, in our empathy, we illuminate a savior who is more than enough, who is everything this world needs and hopes for. Easier said than done, yeah? May God give us grace. Would you stand with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we're amazed when we look at Jesus. Who knew more? what the world needed and how to accomplish it efficiently than you, Savior. And yet, so often, you withheld and you just stayed and you modeled infinite compassion. You said, I was sick and in prison and you visited me. Give us grace to make that true. To do that for the least of these, the hurting, the broken, the helpless, the weak, the lonely, and the left behind. Help us to be authentic followers of Jesus, to model your compassion and to build your kingdom in this way. Friends, if, uh, if you've got anything at all going on in your life you'd like prayer for, we'd love to walk that with you, to listen, to care, to pray, to support you. Please don't ever come to church in the presence of God with the family of believers and leave carrying that burden alone. Not when Jesus is among us. And so there's nothing magical that any of us is going to do or say, um, but to care, to do just exactly what we talked about and to pray with you. If you'd like to receive prayer for anything at all, uh, if our elders and our staff, you just find your way to the, to the front corners, then please do come and let us pray with you. Hey, everyone, have an amazing week. Enjoy the instant gratification Sunday, the beautiful weather. Core team is tonight. Core team is everybody who serves or leads in any way at Denver United. Our gathering of celebration and connection is tonight. It's for you. Please prioritize that time. We want to, you're a big deal around here. The word of God says the saints in the land, they're the glorious ones. And in, in you is all God's delight. You're our delight as well. We look forward to sharing a meal and sharing time together with you uh, at the core team gathering. And if you have any questions about that or, or who that's for, talk to any one of our staff or the engaged team out here. We look forward to seeing a bunch of you then. Have an amazing week and we'll see you next Sunday. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged this week by God's word. For more information about our church, events, or to simply submit a prayer request, visit us online at denverunited.com.